panel is called Building Decarbonization, New Money, New Opportunity in Residential and Commercial Buildings. This panel will be moderated by my colleague, Emma Coker, who is an associate uh, here at BNEF focused on heating and cooling. She will be joined by Philip, I don't know why I just did that. Hello, Philip Delorme, who is executive vice president in the energy management, management business and member of the executive committee at Schneider Electric, alongside Mariangela Fabri, who is head of research at the Building Performance Institute in Europe, along with Jonathan Maxwell, CEO and founder of SDCL, as well as Mara Gajic, who is International Marketing and Strategy Officer at Muller Group. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Dana. 2020 has been an absolutely massive year for buildings. We have seen many countries targeting buildings in their fiscal stimulus packages. Creating jobs, decreasing energy use and healthier homes are all part of why we're seeing this. To kick us off, we've got a quick question to each of the panelists. Which of these funding packages and policies excited you the most in 2020? Philippe, if I could come to you first. Right. So actually, there are many, and that's a great news. But the one I would quote is probably the EU Renovation Wave, which is a strategy paper, which will be translated into a, a more of a policy. But that's a very, very good news. I'm sure we're going to be back to that. Totally. And Mara? Um, yeah, well, I would, to follow up on the EU, in France, the government has announced a massive um, finance package for uh, the re recovery and 6.7 billion euros are going to go into the um, renovation of buildings, the building stock in France. And I think that's going to be very exciting for us. Right. Maria Angela, and you? Yes, I can only echo the renovation wave, but there's something else that goes with that, which is the um, recovery and resilience fund that was approved. So which not only the big package, but the money that goes to make sure that that package, that the renovation is productive. Exactly. And Jonathan, to round us out. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to see a, a huge focus, unprecedented really focus on buildings and industry, I think, over the course of the next decade. Uh, so for somebody who's been involved with the energy efficiency industry for the last decade, I think it's going to look very different um, for the next 10 years. And we're really excited about being part of that. Thank you. Yes, the EU renovation wave getting a lot of love and not surprising, it was only released last week and has announced some massive targets for buildings. We have also seen the likes of Germany, Denmark and Ireland also uh, putting a lot of money towards buildings. So audience, it's your time now, based on these funding policies and packages, do you think this is going to be enough to get us to net zero by 2050? You can go all out and be optimistic and click yes. You can be slightly more cautious. Yes, but not before 2050 or not by 2050. No, we're going to need more than the policies I've just spoken about and extra and just outright, no, hopefully not. It's just far too complex to resolve in the next 30 years. So we're going to start seeing some answers here. Wow, okay, so we're pretty split. There's not some kind of true optimist out there. Uh, we've got maybe a few more skeptics dialed into this call. Uh, looks like we're going to be needing more policy and funding. I'll call it there. So we have just briefly spoken about the EU renovation wave. There have been some massive targets put out, a 60% reduction in emissions from buildings and an 18% reduction in heating and cooling demand. Mini Angela, I'd like to come to you first. What is this going to do to buildings? Um, a, f a few things, uh, but the the renovation, what the renovation wave does, it's really basically disclosing the commission's vision for buildings and its own work plan for the next five years. And, and so the rest of its mandate. And um, it highlights a few things. Uh, one, which is really important to, to say is, many different action points. There is not one simple solution and we have to make sure that we intervene in multiple areas at the same time, because we all know buildings are not all the same. 
And it does, it does provide a vision for decarbonizing uh, the building stock. Um, and uh, its success really will depend on how it will be implemented. And the plan is to actually tackle the building stock by doing two things, adjusting the existing legislations, which had very uh, recently been um, reviewed. So the Energy Performance Building Directive, the Renewable Energy Directive, the Energy um, Efficiency Directive, while at the same time introducing new tools like digital building logbooks, uh, building renovation passport, and at the same time goes beyond, and this is what is really new about the renovation wave, goes beyond energy performance in buildings and look at buildings as a whole at its circularity principle. So the commission has also committed to develop a roadmap for a whole life um, building um, so cycle. So um, very exciting years ahead. Uh, if it's done properly, it can really reshape building. Great, thank you so much. We're going to be touching on the system impact of buildings from this a bit later on, but I'd like to bring Philippe in now. What are some of your thoughts about the EU renovation wave? So first of all, I'd like to quote a few figures just to illustrate why this is so important. So we all know about the goal of 2050 and be carbon neutral. Now, what people know a bit less is that uh, building represents 40% of the carbon footprint of the, of, of the problem, let's say. And they are largely inefficient. And the very good news on top of it is that for the innovation, for the European um, um, package that is being prepared, uh, there is a clear target at existing building. And today, we have to realize that 90% of the, the existing building will still be there by 2050. So it's really important that we target our policies to make sure that we optimize the building stock, which is responsible for the large part of the carbon footprint, because that's the way to deal with the problem. Now, what we strongly believe, uh, back to the poll, and you know, uh, is it possible, not possible, is that actually there is a path to 2050 carbon neutrality, but that path will have to go with two essential technology. One, making buildings more electric. When we say we need to get rid of carbon, we need to remove carbon from buildings. That means that, for instance, gas heating is no good. Uh, and electrical heating or cooling is much better. Second one, and uh, second one is digitization and use digital technology at the phase of operation, but also at the phase of design and build. One, to build right in the first place, do the right simulation, do the right construction phase, which is today extremely inefficient, and then run the building in a modern way, automate them, drive energy efficiency, and actually connect the dots with what's around the building, more the microgrid and so on. So a lot of innovation that actually does exist today that will drive building to carbon neutrality by 2050, indeed uh, prompted and supported by the EU regulation and package that are coming up. Yeah, exactly. So that was a bit of the what and a bit more about the how. I'd like to come to the why. So Jonathan, if I could bring you in, why is this important and, wh and why do we need this now? So um, Philippe's absolutely right. Then one of the biggest chunks of energy demand and carbon emissions is buildings. Um, and if we look at the way in which we need to address that over the next decade, um, a huge amount of the um, energy supply to buildings in the first place is inefficient. Um, so in certain economies in Europe and North America, um, we're wasting up to two thirds of the energy, <laughs> primary energy being generated by the time it gets to the point of use in buildings. And then buildings go on to, to waste 20, 30% of the energy. So there's a huge inefficiency in the energy system. You know, it's the first point to make. It's an unbelievably important um, point to make fundamentally because the productivity gains associated with efficient supply of energy to buildings and indeed the way in which energy is used in buildings is a huge win. Um, it's a huge win financially for, for, for companies. Um, it's a huge win for government and it's a huge win for job creation. From why it's important, um, also, uh, uh, candidly, I think this is an area that we can really get our teeth into and address. You know, if you look at where energy is used in industry, steel, cement, chemicals, um, uh, you know, the huge opportunities for electrification, green gas, hy hydrogen. If you look at the um, hospitality sector, the, ho the uh, ho uh, hospitals sector across Europe, um, massive opportunities for energy efficiency in public buildings. And then, of course, 
you know, to pick up on another angle of Philippe's point, you know, digitization, you know, we're saying different types of buildings using energy in different ways. And of course, as we electrify, um, we're also now being driven more and more by IT, telecoms, and data centers. So the application of energy efficiency technology inside of all types of buildings, commercial, industrial, public sector, data uh, centers, and indeed, uh, of course, in the residential market. These are the critical ways in which we're going to reduce energy demand, reduce carbon emission reductions, reduce waste, and actually improve productivity and performance. Yeah, exactly. We um, Thank you so much for that. We saw David's talk this morning highlighting just how important data can be. And we have a huge opportunity for digitalization in the building sector, for sure. Mara, I'd like to bring you in and maybe focus on the uh, France package for a minute. Do we think it is targeted in the right way? Um, I would say that versus previous sort of government incentive programs that we've had, that can sometimes create small bubbles and perhaps not trickle down necessarily to um, users at the end of the day or owners or people, you know, uh, regular, you know, John Doe's. Um, I do think that this package will make sense and it will, it will go in the right direction um, when we get the message out there and we have a clearer vision of what exactly are uh, the, the mechanisms behind it. Um, I don't necessarily think it's enough because um, you always want to do more. And I saw some per pessimistic <laughs> people on the uh, on the poll earlier where you do need, um, you know, you, ne you need support, you need financial support and you need to get the message out there. And in addition to like the, the recovery plan that's going to focus almost seven billion euros on the renovation of buildings, there's also a grassroots program going on um, in France. That's I think the. English translation would be the Citizens Convention on Climate. And it's more of like a grassroots approach to um, tackling building emissions. And I think that it's a really good approach because they're really focusing um, on the building as a whole. Um, because, you know, the three previous people I'll mentioned, you can't just focus on one thing. It was great to have um, this big push to replace oil boilers with heat pumps that has been going on for the last 18 months in France. Um, where in essence, given the different incentives, a person can get on a heat pump for a euro. However, it didn't actually result in a huge amount of people uptaking the program. But if you're looking at the building as a system and as a whole, this um, Citizens Convention on Climate is really looking at the building as a whole. So it's about heavy renovations on insulation of your buildings, which already is a major step forward. And it's frequently too financially heavy a burden to to attack and so i think that moving from the building envelope and then going inside and looking at the heating system the ventilation systems the air uh, conditioning etc it really needs to be looked at as a as a global approach but i think it's i think it's going in the right direction Perfect. Yes, the case of the missing money. We've heard about this a lot across a number of different sectors, I think. Philippe, if we can round out this section before we move on to business models, is there anything missing? Are we, you know, is there something glaring you think should have been part of these packages? I guess the translation, I mean, the, this renovation wave is a strategy. It's not yet a policy. So what, what we are pushing for and, and wishing that we can translate at the European level very, very quickly this strategy into policy so that we move into supporting mechanisms that our businesses would be very clear to execute upon. Thank you so much. So that was a bit more about the what we've seen in coming out in the most recent months. I'd like to transfer now to a discussion about business models. How do we get this funding out the door? So Jonathan, I'd like to come to you. Energy efficiency has been notoriously hard to incentivize over the last decade. Europe is already spending the most globally and that is nowhere near enough. We've seen 1%, that 1% 1 average number stay year on year on year. What do you think we need to do? Um, I think there are two, two or three types of actors um, that need to be brought together. One is the building users themselves. And I think the current period of time where cost efficiency comes to the fore for all energy users, I think is hopefully an important catalyst um, to get things moving. So, you know, we are certainly seeing a huge amount of interest in certainly commercial industrial 
uh, to some extent, public sector end users of energy um, in driving towards cost reduction. But that actor needs to be at the table. Um, and, you know, to, to, to talk about that from a business model perspective, regulation can help. But actually, cost efficiency is a massive driver at the end of the day. And that's really what their shareholders should be concerned with. Second actor that needs to be at the table are companies like Philips, which is you know major utilities, IPPs, OEMs in the sector, um, uh, offering you know great products and services from you know, demand side management tools like obviously lighting, HVAC insulation, digitization, controls, through to support side measures. Um, and you know I think the good news about energy efficiency is the technology is here today, as we all know, to deliver a massive change. I think the rest of it. I would say this because the business I'm in that is about delivering this in the way that's the simplest to make, execute um, and involves as little pernicious upfront capital expenditure for companies and uh, counterparties as possible. Um, and I would say that because, you know, we've spent the last decade of my life building energy services, for, um, you know, solutions, um, energy as a service. And we've seen explosive growth in that uh, business model, actually, in our case, over the last two years. With uh, our capital base has increased six or seven times, uh, so it's been an extraordinary um, growth period, and it's driven by cost efficiency, the increasing focus on carbon efficiency in public and um, you know, private sector, um, and frankly, the fact that energy as a, as a service works extremely well, reducing costs, transferring risk, and improving productivity. So, as a business model, energy services. Uh, whether it's power, heat, light, all of these things can be delivered certainly by my company, SDCL, and companies like Philips. Yeah, energy as a service is an interesting one. We often hear it as a hype word, but it sounds like you're putting um, a lot of money behind it. it be interesting to see how this plays out in the next few years. But Angela, I'd like to bring you in. So Jonathan's just mentioned we need to get people involved. Do you think this is enough? Is there enough of a hype or do we live in a, in a buildings bubble? Apologies, I think the microphone's not quite yes, right. Sorry, I realized I was just mute. <laughs> um, people would like to be to be involved, but we all know how difficult it is. Anyone who's tried to just do a simple renovation in the household could be. So I think what these different policy packages and what the companies that provide energy services and any type of construction services can do is to make the journey towards renovation easier for uh, for the people so that they realize that it can be done. What does it mean? It means um, financing mechanism for, for renovation and for deep renovation, technical assistance for uh, not only um, uh, the, the national governments, but the local authorities that we will manage these uh, and most of, of, of the renovation programs. It also means better information and also an understanding that Improving the building stock doesn't only has positive effect in terms of decarbonization and energy efficiency. Um, it also actually has positive benefits on the comfort and the well-being of those living and occupying those buildings. I've referenced to the residential sector because I think that's one area which is really difficult because it's almost a matter of convincing one person after the other of the benefits of uh, a renovated and highly performant and uh, uh, decarbonized building stock. Um, but other areas are equally, um, equally, equally different and difficult. So we need to make sure that all these packages and all the money that has been put to the table is actually translated in, in workable mechanisms that facilitate, facilitate the access to renovation and make it a desirable investment and not just a nuisance that we have to go through because, uh, you know, our, our house uh, is, is old and needs to be a little bit of, of retrofit and, and be that. Sure, thank you so much. So Mara, I'd like to bring you in just on that. So it will be challenging and we're going to need business models that work. So you mentioned the one euro heat pumps. It sounds great to me. They obviously didn't work as well as planned. What are some of the business models you think we need to see? Well, I think that, um, I mean, it does loop back to the two previous comments. It's really about getting the information out there 
And obviously also increasing the financial support because, um, you know, if it's a one in one out, you know, you know, part of your uh, heating system goes down, you might not know better and you'll just switch in for, for, you know, the equivalent or maybe a tiny bit better. So what we're focusing on is really educating and getting the message out there to end users, to uh, the professional building uh, installers, electricians, what not about the different options that are available because to loop back to what um, I think it was Philippe that said it, the technology exists. Like we, the technologies are out there, whether it's really efficient heat pumps or domestic hot water heat pumps or smart and connected heating, those exist, but I, uh, there's definitely a, a lack of knowledge about them. Um, and so, you know, us, for example, um, you know, we're we're talking to our customers about how the low carbon revolution is underway and it's passing through your home. And so the idea is to really get them involved and get them to understand that it's not just about being, you know, a green citizen. It's also, uh, you know, congratulations, you'll help the reduction of, of carbon emissions in buildings, but also you'll have um, affordable uh, systems in your home and you'll maintain your comfort. These are all very important things. So I would say yeah, it's about getting the message out there on one to all the different deciders, uh, owners, uh, property developers, end users, um, and installers for the professionals um, in the in the building industry. And then, of course, through that, you can come up with services. So, um, you know, they were talking about energy as a service. We would talk about heating as a service. You know, uh, it's not it's no longer just about us selling a product into the market and then no longer having an interaction with our with our users. Um, thanks to digitalization, we can also provide services and advice and counsel to our users. And um, it's it's started for us, and it's it's slow, but I think that it'll uh, I think that it'll pick up in in the coming years. Absolutely, there's kind of no choice. We we've got to do it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We've obviously got a few skeptics in the audience, but it's a transition that has to be taken. Um, I'd just like to move on to the last section before we take the audience Q&A. So if you are in the audience and you have a few questions for the panellists, please start populating them um, as we discuss the system impacts from buildings. So taking a step back and looking now at how buildings fit into the kind of wider infrastructure. Maria Angela, I'd like to come to you. What would this package if we can manage to kind of get it out the door and get this funding as we're talking through these business models and get the information out there what is this going to do to buildings role in the wider sector i think it will enable um, buildings actually becoming uh, micro energy apps and really being instrumental to the decarbonization of the energy system uh, and mostly in, uh, in in two ways We've known that buildings have been considered static and passive elements of our, of our environment and of our built environment of our cities. What we can do and what will happen if these and these package mean, mean the renovation wave, but also the other, all the other packages that have been introduced throughout the world, not only in Europe in the last, in the last year will actually be implemented, would be really allowing increasing the energy um, energy consumption of buildings, that is going to be the most essential part because that the remaining needs will be supplied with renewable energy, investing in storage, in demand restore, in demand response. Digitalization will definitely help understanding how our buildings work in connection to the grids individually, but also as a group, really looking more towards a district approach and not only individual buildings performance, individual buildings efficiency, and um, that will open up an entire new world on how we actually can produce and manage energy uh, for, uh, for our building stock. And decarbonizing heating and cooling is going to be an essential part. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Integration is going to be pretty key for buildings. I'd like to bring Jonathan in on that. How do you see this playing out for the power sector? Is energy efficiency going to decrease the needs of the grid or are we actually going to see increased capacity being needed? I mean, it's going to, energy efficiency is about how you get energy to the building in the most efficient way and how it's used inside. So it's going to bring online technologies and it's going to increase the penetration of certain types of technologies. It's a huge stimulus for green electricity. Uh, it's a very significant stimulus for green gas. 
um, in certain applications where electricity finds it harder to, to, to provide the service. Um, it's a very significant demand pull for you know all of the technologies, lighting, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and so on, together with the smart meters and controls that sit behind digitization. So buildings is the end customer. That's who we're all servicing <laughs> at the end of the day. That's where such a big chunk of energy demand is used. It's where we all live and work and uh, everything is made. And in fact, it's how we're communicating today, albeit sort of through the ether, but through data centers and, and, and switchboards. So, you know, I think the key thing is to understand that the customer. <laughs> That's what we're all doing this for, is to provide electricity to the point of use and to make sure when it's used, it's used in the most efficient way possible. They're going to be, that the place to look for all new technology, uh, penetration, innovation, growth, I believe, in the energy sector. It, 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 talk to your customer. Exactly. It used to be, well, the office and home, and sometimes now your office is your home. So, um, Philippe, I'd like to bring you in on that. What is Schneider's thoughts on kind of how the building sector will integrate with the wider grid and the wider sector? So, uh, I, I'd like, before we talk about that, that we talk about digital technology, uh, because we've been uh, kind of talking about it at the surface, but wanted to be back on that point of how digital is going to transform totally the building sector. Uh, we don't talk much about everything that's happening in the design and build phase, while actually there is a massive transformation here. We've talked a lot about operation, but think about all the tools, the software tools that would allow you to design building in a much more efficient way with a lot of simulation. Think about the phase of construction and the, the, the fact that today 30% of the work that's happening in construction is rework, 10% is wasted. So, because people are not working very well together. So, there is a whole field of innovation and experimentation to drive software usage so that the build phase is more efficient. And then comes the phase of operation where, indeed, as Jonathan said it, buildings are at the center of the infrastructure what we call the new electric world infrastructure, because they are both, consu both consuming energy and producing energy. So you need to think the building in the context of an ecosystem where digital will connect the dots. Digital will allow those buildings to be working within the ecosystem, working also with a water network because it's part of the whole infrastructure to produce uh, and consume energy. And you know, when we talk about it, it's not science fiction. Last week, I had the chance to be with some colleagues in Australia, in the western part of Australia, where today, at scale, we have cities that works with full renewable energy, connected and smart buildings, and all of these install installation infrastructure working digitally together real time to feed demand and supply in a very variation way, which is really paving the way to what we're talking about, which is a new electric world, which can be carbon neutral by 2050, because it is possible. Yes, exactly. I think the key point there, new builds are actually leading the way in terms of being able to decrease energy use overall. I know the EU renovation wave quoted that a new build today would use at least half of a building that was built only 20 years ago. So we're making significant strides in new builds. I'd like to move to Mara, just before we move to the Q&A. How hard is it to integrate smart technologies into older homes? Are you still seeing this as you know, a big challenge or are we actually now, um, you know, we're this far forward in the system to be able to integrate into, you know, retrofits or, you know, existing buildings? Yeah, so I would say uh, that'll depend on the market. But for example, in France, we have a very important um, stock of electric heating um, because we have uh, nuclear energy and whatnot. And at least for Muller Group, we've been manufacturing smart and connected electric heating solutions for the past few years. And so 80% of what we're selling for electric heating is already smart and connected. Um, but what we see is that um, you know, so these are products that integrate absence detection, open window detection. You can, you know, control them from a distance, you know, et cetera. Um, but I would say of the millions that we sell, uh, it's, you know, not even 10% that actually connect them. So <laughs> I think that the idea will be, it's, it's very possible to, to, um, renovate, uh, with, with the smart and connected solutions, 
Um, but again, it's about, I would say, education, informing informing users on, on what the possibilities are um, and why what these possibilities, uh, what 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 this connection, what these connected devices can do for them. Uh, can it help them save money? Can it help them, um, you know, uh, have a better energy score on their building if they want to sell it after? Um, what are, what are the advantages for them beyond just having a cool connected device? And so I think that a lot of it is about, um, yeah, education and 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 proving your case. What why is this interesting? Why is it important? And what can it do for you? Oh, well, that's. That's quite shocking, 10% of people using these devices, so it sounds like the technology is here, but yeah, the education part is going to play a big role. Um, as I understand it, Dana is going to come back in and uh, start the Q&A for us. Hi. Okay, so we have our first audience question. So we have one specifically for Jonathan, and the question is, could you provide a bit more detail on green the green gas opportunity with reference to buildings decarbonization? Great, thank you for the, uh, the question. I mean, I think um, as just a step back, I think you know we can see real opportunities um, on recycling gases. So we have a significant um, portfolio now. Just, uh, over the last decade, we've put together about a billion dollars for investment in different types of energy efficiency projects on the supply or demand side. One of those projects is a a uh, project that takes recycled uh, blast furnace gases, flue gases, and recycles them into useful electricity and steam for steel mills. Steel, as we all know, is one of the largest contributions to greenhouse gases, um, and even, you know, within industry or more generally. Uh, so I think, you know, that type of recycled gas, I think, is a very exciting opportunity within the industrial sector. Agriculture, we have biogas that we produce uh, within our portfolio, where we use the biogas to create renewable power. Uh, we were very pleased yesterday, actually, to announce the acquisition of Stockholm's Green Gas Grid, which takes, amongst other things, waste gases from the wastewater treatment plant and distributes it to residential, commercial and transport uh, customers in Stockholm. So I think there's a lot to learn. Um, about the application of green gas. The big, um, the big story for the next decade, and certainly from a European policy perspective, will be stimulating another type of green gas, which will be hydrogen. So we'll be excited to see how that uh, plays out over the course of the next decade. And you know, obviously in between hydrogen and natural gas, there are quite a lot of different shades. So I think within that context, biogas, recycled industrial gases, um, and indeed the next wave, um, I should say, which will be the hydrogen uh, story, definitely, or at least in my opinion, definitely in the chemical sector and potentially on stuff that moves around like ships and planes. I think we're going to see a lot of um, exciting news on the gas side. Great. So our next one has to do with regulatory frameworks. So it says regulatory frameworks have to adapt to allow for the transmission and distribution system to evolve to these trends. Are you hopeful that this will be done in an orderly and planned manner? And the example that was given was FERC 2222, if you're familiar with that one. I think, Philippe, do you want to kick us off on that one? So I, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the FERC 222 uh, regulation, but what I can say is, I mean, clearly what we see on the grid side is that there is going to be a push for renewable energy. And if the grid don't adapt to that, they're just going to collapse or die. Uh, so in our view, so on one side, there is no doubt that there will be more renewable in the grids, uh, more decentralized type of loads, by the way, more microgrids. And the grid, as a result, will have to adapt by getting more digital and therefore more flexible and sustainable. Otherwise, the thing is not going to work. So maybe there are going to be regulation, but I would say with or without regulation, if today you are the CEO of a utility and you don't have a plan to digitize your network, you are already in trouble. <laughs> So, so and, and frankly, I mean, we all love regulation, but at some point there is a law of gravity. And in that case, the law of gravity will apply faster than anybody thinks. Great. Okay, well, then we can switch to the next one is when will we start seeing the impact of these funding packages on building decarbonization and how long will it ha take to have real impact on emissions? Does anyone have a guess on that one? 
Would you like to kick us off? Uh, yes. So how fast, <laughs> how long it will take to, to see the impact, I think. Uh, it really depends on how fast and how good uh, the authorities in charge of that are from a regulatory perspective. Um, I, I keep have referring to the to, uh, to renovation wave, the Clean Energy Pact that was adopted a, a couple of years ago and, and the, recovery, the recovery fund, because I think all the ingredients for a fast and impactful implementation are there. But there's only so much that can that can happen at a regulatory um, um, level. So now I would say it's up to not only the member states, for example, the national governments that can use the recovery funds to decarbonize the building stock and, and to renovate, but also how fast and how willing other players in the market in the entire construction supply chain are to make sure that these changes happen really fast. Um, how long will it take to decarbonize? It, it really depends on the former. Um, but it can be done, I think, pretty, pretty quickly. The, the positive impact of, of decarbonizing the stock can happen really fast if, uh, if all the right measures and technologies are put in place. Hey, and Philip, do you have something to add on this? I'd like to compliment because actually in 2020, uh, without regulation, with one thing called COVID, uh, the planet will emit probably up to minus 8% of carbon. So if anyone has a doubt that reducing carbon is possible, there is no more doubt. Uh, now, I think we said it many times, technology do exist. Yes, we're going to get uh, frameworks and so on, but I, I would leave it to, I mean, if there are CEOs watching, CEOs have to lead. And uh, if you are a real estate developer, um, uh, uh, I mean, you have a sustainability imperative that's being driven by your board. And there is just a must. Uh, the, the, all players are moved into more sustainability, more efficiency. And yes, it works. So, it's great to have an EU, uh, an EU renovation wave, fantastic. The world has decarbonated minus 10% in 2020 by brute force COVID, which is no fun and not wishable because it has all been painful for everybody, but it shows it is possible. I, 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 to, to, just to show also how quickly it's possible, um, you know, in terms of how quickly it takes to change light bulbs in our experience, as an example, as a technology, I think this is an important point. Um, we were involved in 2015 in the, the largest um, lighting as a service uh, contract delivered to that point, I think since as well. A, over 800 buildings, 90,000 lamps, start to finish, nine months completed. <laughs> um, you know, huge energy cost reduction and energy demand reduction. Um, uh, we've done that in uh, 400 car parks. We've done it across our portfolio in over 1,500 buildings um, that we've developed, either developed or financed implementation of energy efficiency technology. So only within that sample set, I can say as a general rule, well, Philippe can tell me if he thinks I've got my number wrong. The general rule, anywhere between three and nine months for energy efficiency technology implementation. Uh, even building integrated or rooftop solar or private wire uh, technologies don't take more than three to six months, maybe nine at the outside if you have to demobilize because of COVID. On the supply side, if you bring power to buildings, that's where you get into slightly more uh, you know, longer lead time. So it's at something like 18 months plus or minus, I think would be the expectation for bringing you know, a high efficiency on-site uh, co-generation system or something really substantial in terms of a 24-7, um, you know, totally resilient energy infrastructure solution, including renewables. But I mean, this can be done incredibly quickly. What we need to do is get on with it. And, you know, the, the, the other point I would make is, I, I think the other important thing to recognise is, for, you know, for me, the European Commission statement is a policy earthquake. It's the best possible signal ever to send. Um, it will require much more private sector capital than public sector capital. And actually, you could even argue that the public sector capital should really be targeted where private sector can't take the risk. So in stimulating and creating what they call technical assistance to provide the, the audits and the review of the, of the building stock across Europe. And then second, 
perhaps a bit more controversially on the credit side. We're getting into a relatively difficult period of time and outside of the public sector support on the credit side, I think would be very helpful. Well, so we have another one that has to do with COVID and financial impact. So it says, will COVID-19's financial impact make it more difficult to provide financial support for heat pumps and efficiency? And what does this mean for energy as a service and private loan business models? Um, so, I mean, if you if you want, we can address this even just as a, will it make financial support more or less difficult, which is how we've been framing some of the COVID-19 questions that have come in earlier. So, Mara, do you want to kick us off with this one? Um, well, you know, <clears throat> again, I'm going to use the French example. Um, it, obviously, the economy is hit hard, uh, but the government has put their is putting their money where their mouth is in terms of uh, supporting this switch off. And so, I would say that it's actually going to help. That's my short answer. Okay. Well, that is all the time that we have for audience questions at this point, but I believe, Emma, you have a closing question to ask the panel. Just a short one. It's a yes or no, hopefully slightly more positive than the poll results. Um, are we on the right track? Mitty, Angela, what do you think? If everything is done and implemented. So a few caveats, Jonathan. Uh, the signals are absolutely right. I agree. Positive signals. I think we're on the right track. Awesome. And Philippe, to round us out. Yeah, I think it's on the right track. Uh, I, I do believe there is a, a fantastic opportunity to accelerate digitization, uh, which is more ready than what people think. So for people who are driving infrastructure, uh, I would just invite them to uh, move in and move on uh, because the technologies are available. And actually, there are many partners like SDCL, for instance, that are ready to get things done in partnership with technology providers. So just for people to grab, and it's it's a very good business case. So the challenge is out there. We are on the right track, but it looks like for buildings, we still have a long way to go. I really look forward to discussing this again next year. Dana, back to you. Mm -hmm.